then suspend it or? Oh no, we can start right now. To Team DLZ, today is Sunday, March 24th, 2024. This is officially my fifth day in jail. I want to explain to you how this place works a little bit. So when I was intaked from the courtroom into the jail, they put me in the torture cuffs and the bailiff, who I had called the pig, put the torture cuffs on nice and tight. And you look at the room that's dark oak and robes and deep red overtones in the room. And ironically, just less than 40 feet away, there's a door that leads to the dungeon. And when they open the door, it's all white with a stripe that goes around the room. And the room's 12 feet by 8 feet deep. And they put you in there and the tor you look around and there's nothing there but you. And then maybe a minute later, the two bailiffs came in and immediately began to pat me down briskly as though they were giving me a terrible massage from my ankles up to the top of my hair. Their pans are coursing over my body and they're feeling every single inch of my pants, my suit jacket. They begin to crumble it and want it and twist it because I'm already in the torture cuffs and they're tight. And I tell them, please, the torture cuffs are, are tight. We don't have to like each other, but you don't have to torture me. And he says, you'll be out of them in a minute. And then he says, I'm going to bring your lawyer in. They leave as quickly as they came in. And then the lawyer comes in and Michael, me, his face is red and he's disoriented. And I look at him and I actually say to him, like, so... I'm going through shock, and at the same time, then there's a chain, and then you, they walk me through, and they say, let's let's switch him up. So then they bring me over, and they take the torture cuffs off, they say, take off your jacket. I take off my jacket, and then they say, all right, take off your shoes. I take off my shoes, one shoe, one sock, and then they, they take a flashlight, and they look at my feet, and they, and they roll my pant leg up, and then they... They take me from there, and they now they say, take off your overshirt and just wear your wear your overshirt. Get rid of your white T-shirt because it's going to be cold. And then I'm wearing my slacks and my button-up white dress shirt. And then they take me over to medical. So then they, I take off both shirts, and then I put the button on, the white button up. My, my suit pants are fairly new, so my shirt's brand new. And so then I'm just wearing orange like water shoes and then I'm wearing my slacks and my button-up white dress shirt and then they take me over to medical and uh, they take my blood pressure and my blood pressure is 170 over 110 and she says well do you have high blood pressure and I say I, I used to I took care of it I said isn't that pretty high and she said it's not so high understanding the circumstances and then I I say, understanding the circumstances, she says, yeah, in the situation that you're in now, it's, it's, it's expected your blood pressure is going to be a little high. And I said, but isn't that really high? She said, you'll be okay. And then they take me from there in shackles, and they sit me down on a bench, and then they shackle me into a chair. And then I have to sit in this chair, and then I look over to the other people, and I say, hey, was your blood pressure high? And they say, yeah. And I said, did she say to you, it's, it's and I asked multiple people, and they say, yes. And then I go into a holding cell, and I'm in this holding cell. I get in there maybe around 3 or 4 o'clock, and I'm in this holding tank until 4 o'clock in the morning. You, can't, you, you can lay down, but it's freezing, freezing cold. And so then I'm in the holding cell for 12, 15 hours. I don't know how long. And then they say, you're transferred upstairs. And I go upstairs, and now this is a room. It's a big room, like a big auditorium room. There's... there's stainless steel tables in the middle with stainless steel stools that go around them and there's probably four of them and there's you know six or eight stools at each table so there's, you know maybe 50 people consider these four tables and around the room are doors i don't know where those doors lead so now at this point i have to take off all my clothes drop them into a bag and then walk into the shower area and i go in the shower drop all your clothes outside put them in a the bag and so I do that. We don't put them in bags until I go in the shower. And then they come around, they take the bag, so you're buck naked in the shower. And then I take a shower, and then the guard comes around, he says, all right, open your mouth. I open my mouth. He says, all right, turn around, spread your butt cheeks, squat, and cough. I don't. I just turned around, tap the butt sides of my butt cheeks, and, <laughs> and the guard was about 70, and he's like, good enough. And then... Uh, I come out, they give me a pair of these, so I'm wearing the exact same clothes that I put on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. Then this is called isolation for 24 to 48 hours. It's 
rooms of one or two people. For me, it's going to be two. So I, I go to this, he says, your name to Castro, inmate number. I now have it memorized, 1669561. And then I go, and he says, you and you go to room number 37. I'm walking to the room, and the guy next to me passes me. And I think, I guess he's in a hurry to get to the room. We walk into the room. He goes to the two bunks. He grabs the two mattresses, looks at them, picks the mattress he wants, puts it on the bottom bunk, and then throws the other one on the upper bunk, then takes the sheets we got and the blanket, quickly makes himself a bed, gets in the bed, and puts the covers over his head. <laughs> it was kind of like a surreal moment. I was like, all right. So then I said, hey, man, I'm chilly. Nice to meet you. He said, Nick. I said, man, this is hell. And he said... Not as bad as war. And there's a metal stainless steel shitter there, and on the back of the shitter is a drinking fountain. And that's the water you're going to have to drink. I'm there for maybe two minutes, and the door comes and opens. I'm taken out of that cell, and I'm put in room 23. And I remember thinking it was Michael Jordan's number, one of the largest investors in prisons in America. particular room doesn't face the sun. It faces another building. So I'm grateful for that. So I take two matches, I lay them down, and I lay down, and I try to sleep, but I can't. So I start to do stretches. I'm doing stretches and counts of 30. I do every single kind of stretch I can do. I'm pacing back and forth. I stretch. I do 200, 300 push-ups. Handstand push-ups, I do the burpees, I do mountain climbers, doing anything I can to get the time to pass. It's just dripping by so slow. And so then I, I go over to the mirror and I begin a, a, a set of positive affirmation. <sighs> it's hard to t tell you guys, but it's true. And I'm coming apart, you know. I've been in this room alone for 10 or 11 hours One now. Debt no to society later. They bring food to the door, drop it off, close the door. No stimulation. It's, it's called lockdown, so you're stuck in this room. So I, the food is atrocious. I had been doing Ramadan up until that day. I had blown it one day in L.A., but I was trying to get back on track, and I, I was back on track. I was doing well. I, I had breakfast before the day started on Tuesday. So this was now, I don't know, I don't know. I've lost track of time, maybe Thursday morning. And so I now go over to the, to the, to the window, and I'm to the mirror, and I'm giving myself positive affirmation. You're okay. You can get through this. You're okay. You can get through this. You're a good person. You haven't broken the law. You haven't done anything wrong. You're, this is going to be hard, but you can get through it. And, and it's just so hard because you have no other stimulation. So then at about 15, 16, maybe 17 hours, I don't know how long, I've done sets and sets of stretches, counting to 30 sets and sets. And I'm just trying to, I'm more flexible now than before I went in, but I'm just trying to get through it. Guards are cruel. They're indifferent. They don't care. They don't give a damn. You have to follow a system, and they are flowing you through, and this is the money for the state of Nevada. And if you in any way, shape, or form get in the way of that money, they will deal with you. Under the 1980 case of Johnson versus Glick, the guards are to maintain order, and they can use reasonable force, objective reasonable force, to maintain that order. Now, here in this particular jail, they have banned the chokehold, and they've banned the chair, that torture chair that we see in so many videos. So now Roy is in there, and I finally tell him after 10 minutes of me talking, I say, Roy, please look at me. And he finally looks at me, and I say, man, connect with me, bro. Talk to me for a minute. And in that moment, it's the first human moment I've had in over 24 hours. And I immediately break down and tell him, I shouldn't be in here, Roy. And he, and he, and he, and then he, he says, neither should I, man. And he's, he's, this is a, an, he's an only child. He's, he's a black man and he's a strong person. And he says to me, Chili, you, you need to be strong and you need to hold it together. I said, I'm going to hold it together, but for the love of God, man, we need human connection. If we don't have human connection, we are going to fail in here. And the first time Roy says to me, I know it. He says, damn it, I know it. And then he starts to talk, but he hadn't said a word. He just was all locked up inside. And then for the next maybe 30 minutes. So now this is really incredible what I'm going to tell you right now. So for 30 minutes and I, Roy and I have the most human conversation you could possibly imagine. We talk about everything from our childhood to where we were raised 
to why we're in this dungeon and what the next process is going to be for us as we go through this. And so now there's only one toilet in there, and there's a sink on the back of it. The water tastes like rusted pipes. It's horrible. And the toilet is stainless steel shitter is on the bottom of it. And when you drink the fountain water, it drains down into the toilet. Roy's a big flusher. He likes everything to be flushed. And so, you know, he has to spit. And so he's spitting. He has high blood pressure. His blood pressure is reading 190 over 120. He should be hospitalized, but he's not. And so we're in this room together, and now we have to have a conversation that no two men should ever have to have. And I say to Roy, I say to him, hey, listen, do you have to use the bathroom? And he says, actually, I do. I need to use the restroom soon. So then I, 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 we're, at the, we're at the bottom of the pit of despair where neither one of us should actually be in jail at all whatsoever. Roy doesn't have a real criminal record, and I don't have any criminal record. They look me up here, all the guards have, and I don't have a criminal record besides being before 21 years old. I'm 49 now. So I say to Roy, listen, if you have to use the restroom, just let me know, and I will plug my ears, and I'll turn away. And he said, and I'll flush right away as if I have to use the restroom. And then we say, you know, I say to him, I, I say, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's just a simple fact. When you go to the bathroom, you have to go poop. No other man should have to listen to another man crackle and pop as they take a shit in a toilet. No, 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 nobody should have to, to listen to another man crackle and pop as they take a shit. And we both laugh for the first time that we've been in there. We both laugh and say that is the most honest thing I've ever heard. And I say it's a pet peeve of mine when I go into these restaurants, restaurant stalls in the bathroom and, uh, and they don't play music in the bathroom. You have to go to the bathroom, but there is a sound to going poop. And he says, yeah, there's a sound to going poop. There is. As gross as it may be, unfortunately, when you're put into a situation like we are, you have no choice but to talk about the most human of function, the despair of explaining to another person that they shouldn't have to hear you go to the bathroom. And that's what we have to talk about. And so then it's maybe 20 minutes after that. I don't know because there's no way to keep track of time. You're looking out the window for people who are coming in. But if you look out that window too long, a little tiny window, four inches wide by maybe 24 inches tall, and the, the guards do not, there's a button there that you can push a light. And if you push that light, you're going to be, you may don't push the light. Unless it's a medical emergency, you don't push that light. Because there's only one guard out there, and it's a great big, huge auditorium with those 50 seats I told you about. But we're on 24 to 48 hour lockdown as we're processed in, and I'm literally losing my mind inside of this room. And so Roy says to me, okay, Chili, I have to go to the bathroom. And so at that point, I get on the lower bunk, I plug both my ears, and I start to hum. Um, with my ears plugged because I really don't want to hear another man go to the bathroom. And then I hear the slosh of the toilet. It's like a, it's like a tornado. It's like a hurricane inside of a stainless steel can. And then I hear a moment later, and then I'm still humming. And then I hear Roy say, hey, man, you can stop humming now. And, and, and so I unplug my ears and I turn around and he's gone to the bathroom in maybe a minute maybe one minute. Now, every man over 40 years old knows that when you go to the bathroom as a man, you sit down on the toilet. Sometimes it's even better than sex to sit down on the toilet when you're over 40 years old to let your bowels relax and you can sit there and take a shit. And I hate to be so crude, but this is the actual process of the dungeon and you need to hear it. You need to hear that there's no decency, that every bit of pride is stripped from you, that you are broken down to the most disgusting level that you could possibly even imagine where you have to talk to another man about how you're going to go to the bathroom. He goes, he gets up, and then 
he says to me, let me know if you have to go. And I, I say, I've been limiting my food intake. I've, I've been eating very tiny portions, and then I've been working off the food. So I haven't had to go to the bathroom. So now, after that, maybe I don't know how many minutes, hours, I don't know. But then the guard comes out to the middle of the auditorium and starts to speak. And he says, listen to me. Everybody come to the glass. And so Roy and I go to the glass, and he says, do not push the light on the door. If you push the light on the door and it's not a medical emergency, I'm going to come in there and get you out of there and lock you down. Do you understand? You think this lockdown's bad? It's not going to be a tenth of what we're going to go through. If you push that light on that button, on that door, and it is not a medical emergency. Now, I'm going to serve food. When I come, when I come to the door, you are back by your bunks. We will drop the food off by the door. You can come to the door and grab it after we are gone. Do you understand? Knock on the door. So we knock. It wasn't a knock. It was something else. I don't think he said that. I don't think he said knock. I think my brain's just filling in holes. But I don't think he said knock. I think he just said, do you understand? And that was it. He didn't want any communication back from us. My brain is just, I'm, I'm trying to remember everything detail by detail, but it's all the days and nights are run together. I was arrested on Tuesday afternoon. I think today's Sunday, 24th, and, and I finally last night slept for the first time. 